We didn't know if you were going to make it. It was a joyous event last night. Our, our speaker, Samuel Gurel, is the uh, CEO of Torch Coffee out of, of China. And uh, he comes, I think, originally from Arkansas, but spent time in Alaska and time internationally. And the reason why I say it was a joyous event last night is because Samuel and his wife came to Chiang Mai a little over a month ago. We, we met then and um, had some interaction. But they came because they're expecting the birth of their fifth child. And um, he, born? he was born last night in the hospital. And the baby were doing well. And uh, they're doing fantastic. And Samuel, I think, got a little sleep last night. But I, I'm delighted that you're here, that you made it. This is dedication. So thank you very much, Samuel, for, for coming in and being with us this morning. And Sam's going to talk about um, his reasons for coffee development and what he sees there. So please give a round of applause for Samuel Burrell. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm actually really excited to talk with you guys. Um, sometimes I get to speak at academic conferences and there's a bunch of scientists in a room who write papers and, and those are real fun types as well. But a lot of you guys are the guys out there actually connecting with farmers. And um, I hope that we can uh, talk a little bit today about coffee and the real exciting possibilities in coffee and I'll share a few stories of how we've put those to use. So why coffee? There's thousands of potential crops out there when you're doing development or extension that you could be working in, so why coffee? Um, one of the great reasons, there's a hundred million families worldwide that make their living off of coffee. One hundred million families that make their living off of coffee. Most of those families live in poorer areas, less developed countries. A lot of those farmers are small hole farmers with very little information on how to grow coffee well. For most of those farmers, coffee is one of the only cash crops they'll sell for that whole year. Most of the other crops are growing are going to be some kind of subsistence kind of farming. We've developed a very sim uh, simple formula that really fits with kind of an extension model. We basically say if you take coffee and you put some kind of education or training to that coffee farmer, you can make better quality coffee. We believe that. We've seen that happen over and over again. Most importantly, there's a market out there looking for that better quality coffee. If you can make better quality coffee and no one wants to buy it, that doesn't matter very much, right? There's actually a market looking for better quality coffee. And they'll pay a better price for it. They'll pay a better price for that better quality coffee. And here is the real reason why I'm in coffee, is when those farmers get better price for the coffee, it equals better quality of life. Better quality of life is one of those statements that we say so much it doesn't mean anything anymore. But, but what do I mean by better quality of life? I mean health care, education, nutrition. Uh, we did a study when I was working in Central America like more than 50% of the people working on coffee farms were partly malnutrition. So, I mean, this is not quality of life like a nicer car. This is, this is quality of life as in basic needs. The other reason for coffee is it's one of the only crops that I know of that grows on the scale that it grows on that can be grown very effectively in a forested environment. So coffee comes from where? Highlands of Ethiopia, heavily forested areas. It's very well adapted to grow in forests. It's one of the only products that grows fine in full sun, 
although not as well. Uh, it's much more effective at photosynthesis under partial shade. About 65% shade is ideal, but it can grow up to 80% shade quite, quite well. I've seen it grow in very heavily in forest environments quite well. When you have families that have a better quality of life and you have forests that are healthy, you have more community stability. It actually creates better communities. A lot of, a lot of developing countries use coffee development in poor areas as a, as a primary means to help create social stability. Um, as he said last night, uh, I had a baby. This is, this is him. He's, uh, this was taken this morning, uh, one day old. Uh, I tried to decide, what, should I show these guys a picture of my baby? Is this born yesterday or not, you know? And, of course, the girls all say yes. The guy's like, eh, whatever. Um, so here's why I did it. He, one, he's cute. But also, in, a, in addition to that, I was thinking yesterday, we actually had some complications with this pregnancy. Uh, first two months of pregnancy, we thought we were going to lose a baby. And then the, the, the entire pregnancy, the baby was too small. And then it come time the baby born and the baby wouldn't come out. And so it was like, it was tons of, tons of problems. But here's the difference. I have enough money that I can travel from China to Thailand where it has better health care. The, a lot of the coffee farmers that I'm working with don't have that luxury. They, the, the difference of, a, of a growing a coffee that they get a good price for and make good money for can make the difference in life or death for the babies. It, it, when we're talking about healthcare, a lot of times we get to, we hear so much about it in the political arena that we forget that we're not talking about healthcare. We're talking about babies. And if you're, if you're a parent or not a parent, and you've ever had a loved one who's sick, the helplessness that you feel when you want to do something for them and you don't have the ability is not a good feeling. It's one of the worst feelings. And so, um, I want to evoke your emotions a little bit this morning to get beyond the, the scientific sides of growing coffee to realize that what we're doing actually has the ability to change lives, impact lives, actually maybe even save lives. So what are the keys to making this happen? I'm going to give you an overview and then I'm going to talk about all these. Um, my first point, we absolutely, if we're serious about development, we have to get women involved. Um, there, there's, the research is overwhelming. The research is overwhelming that if you uh, have a, a woman that's in any way involved with managing the money from the coffee farm, and they get a better price for that coffee, 80% of that money will be invested in that farm, health care, education of the children. Things that have long-term sustainability, things that help lift people out of poverty. If there's no woman involved in managing the money of the farm, that number drops to get how much? What do you guys think? Any guesses? Huh? Below 30. It's, it's more like 20% more like 20%. This is absolutely crucial and, and, and frankly, uh, a lot of, none, none of people are talking about it. So we have to get serious about getting women involved and empowering women in this process. Um, thank you for all the women I see that are here today uh, joining in this. Second point is a learner's attitude. Um, this is difficult. We're the scientists, we're the academic, we're the one with all the answers. 
and we're going out to tell farmers what they should be doing, right? And how to do it right. Kind of. Um, I, I, I got into coffee in Honduras. We went there to teach Honduras people how to grow things. I grew up in Arkansas farming. My dad actually worked um, for the University of Arkansas in the uh, research center. Uh, they have a research farm there in Clarksville, Arkansas, mainly doing um, horticulture and fruit trees and stuff. But, um, so we go to Honduras. We show up, we say, we're here to teach you to grow things. They go, great. We've been growing things for thousands of years. You know, we had a major world empire a thousand years ago. We're pretty good at growing things. And we're like, oh, you actually are pretty good at growing things. Well, what do you need? And they said, uh, we, we grow coffee. We can't sell it. We're getting ripped off by the guys buying our coffee. Can you help us find a market for our coffee? So actually, I'm a business owner now. Um, but I come out of a nonprofit world. And um, I found that we need, we need market linkages. People need a place to sell their crop. We need people in business who are also working with developers like you guys to make sure that when people grow these crops, they have a place to sell them. So we're there in Honduras, and they go, uh, can you help us sell our coffee? So that's, how, that's really the, the, the beginning of my, my start in coffee. Also, we need a, a let, me, let me add one more thing. One of the best guys in coffee in the world right now, there's a guy from Mexico named Manuel Diaz. He, he's, he's one of the top guys in coffee, most famous guy in coffee. You know what he does for a living? He's, or, or, I'm sh sorry, his educational background? He's an anthropologist. He's not even an agronomist. And what's made him so famous is he goes to Yemen. And rather than telling the Yemenese farmers how to grow coffee, he goes, you guys have been growing coffee for 1,500 years. What do you know? Now, OK, you may not be doing everything right. There may be some extension that needs to happen here. Don't get me wrong. But I want to learn from you. Why do you do things the way you do? And starting with that kind of learner's approach to extension. We need a nuanced approach, meaning most of the solutions we have are not plug and play. They don't work. You can't have one solution that works everywhere. We need long-term approach. Unfortunately, agriculture, especially when you're doing coffee, you're going to have three to five years minimum before you, before you can make many changes on a farm. You're going to need 50 to 60 years before you're going to really develop great new cultivars. Most people aren't that patient. Most people don't have that long term of, of, a, of an outlook with, with development. Clear outcomes. Um, I work with a lot of development people who aren't really sure what the measurable result is they're looking for. And they're, they're a little afraid to measure it because they're kind of dabbling in a lot of things and doing a lot of stuff, but they're not really having a measurable impact in one area. We talked about market linkages. I'll talk more about that later. Synergy between government NGOs, education, and business. This is, I think, absolutely crucial. If you look at the countries that have done very amazing with coffee development, it's places like Guatemala. You have Ana Cafe, which is the government organization over coffee, who has great extension services. If you take them a soil sample, they'll do it. They'll give you feedback. There's very robust business environment for coffee. There's great NGOs doing work there. And there's an education system all working together with to, to 
take the industry in one direction together. And so often, that's honestly not the case. A lot of times, NGUs are kind of going in this direction, and, and businesses are going in this direction, the government policies are going in another direction. And as these can align, you can have real synergy and real results. How many of you guys have a background with coffee? I mean, other than drinking it. How many of you guys, like, have, yeah, a couple of you guys? I, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to bore a little bit of you guys. I'm going to do a real basic overview of coffee um, to give some context for what I'm talking about. Because I feel if I don't build a little bit of a, a background, we, we won't really get what I'm, the whole point I'm trying to make today. So, my main point is that coffee is deceivingly complicated. It's deceivingly complicated. We grew up drinking it. We feel we know the product. That's the problem with it. We feel we know the product. Um, we, we, however, when you start to talk about red wine, people go, oh, this is, this is a very special kind of product. But coffee doesn't get that kind of respect. And a lot of people um, don't realize how nuanced coffee can be. So historically, when we talked about coffee, there's hundreds of different uh, coffee varieties out there. Uh, but commercially, worldwide, most of them are classified as either Arabica or Robusta. Arabica? is grown um, at high elevations. It was originated in the Ethiopian forest, 1,800 to 2,000 meters high. It loves shade, has a deep tap root, so it can, it's drought resistant, because it has really, the tap root can go down like three meters. So in Yemen, almost no water can, can grow in Yemen. It's self-pollinating. So, on any given tree, the seeds are almost all of identical genetic material, which means it adapts very, very slowly. There's not enough variation for any kind of natural selection to take place because it's, it's all basically the same DNA, right? So the DNA, DNA pool within Arabica species is microscopic. It's really this very limited, uh, now there are variations within Arabica, don't get me wrong, but it changes very slowly, it adapts very slowly to new environments. And so this is one of the problems, a lot of times we need 50 to 60 years for a new variety growing in the same region to really figure out, to really get adapted well and bred well to that environment. Robusta, on the other hand, is a very different plant. Very, very different plant. It, it originates from a much wider range of area, from Uganda to Congo to East Africa, West Africa, all over Africa, and even a little bit on Madagascar. And so here you have a species where the genetic material bank is massive, massive genetic material bank. It's cross-pollinating. So every tree has completely different genetic material, so it um, it adapts quite rapidly. It has no taproot, grows at low elevations, not so drought, drought resistant. Very, much more of a tropical plant. It needs much warmer environments than Arabica. So that's a general overview. And historically, market-wise, we used to say Arabica good, Robusta bad. That was, a, that was how simply we looked at them. That is true, but with coffee, um, everything is very nuanced. So, um, my favorite saying in coffee is, it depends. It depends. And my answer to almost every question is, it depends. Um, Robusta now, in the last five years, we've realized this coffee can be amazing. We can have coffee that's even better than Arabica in some cases. 
So now we've come up with the term specialty Robusta. Very, very high quality Robusta. It's very exciting because it's much more productive plant, much more disease resistant than, than Arabica. Now, we've also crossed these two, right? So there's crosses between Arabica and Robusta. And normally, um, those crosses don't do so well as far as being um, fertile. So you have to do kind of some back crosses to get them fertile again. But now there's another way to look at coffee categories. You can say commercial, specialty, and for years we just had those two, commercial and specialty. But now there's kind of this new category of coffee people are talking about, estate coffee or auction lot coffee. These are extremely high quality lots of coffee. So what's commercial coffee? Commercial coffee is priced the commodity market. Coffee prices trade on the New York coffee sea, and commercial coffee trades on that commodity market. It's low quality, high volume, low margins. It doesn't taste very good. But, and it's usually inconsistent for quality. So I talked about the coffee sea market. This is a chart that shows prices paid to farmers over the last 25 years. So this is starting out in the early 90s. This is extremely low prices. Price goes up, price goes down. La uh, 2012, this price skyrocketed and then drop. It actually went back up again, and now, just so you know, it's back down again. It's actually extremely, extremely low right now. So commercial coffee will trade at the commodities market. It sets the price. Now, what's the problem with that? Who cares? Well, the problem with that is the price that it costs the farmer to grow coffee is not the same every year. Wait, it is the same every year, almost the same every year. And, and the price that it costs most farmers to grow coffee is from about here at about 120 up to 160. About right here, that's the cost of growing coffee. So this is the price paid to farmers, and the cost is right here about 150. Anyone, does anyone see a problem with that? What's the problem? It doesn't make money. It doesn't make money. A lot of years, coffee doesn't make money. If you're selling commercial coffee, a lot of years it doesn't make money. So what's the problem with not making money? Who cares? Why, not, why does that matter? not sustainable. What it also means, so what that means is practically is usually the farmer is going to go out and get a loan to cover and then he's going to be paying interest and then I've seen my f friends farms taken away from them by the people that loan them money and they lose the family farm It's maybe been their family for 10 years, maybe a decade, maybe three decades, maybe maybe a hundred years, maybe forever and and in a lot of those years, they can't keep up their farm maintenance. A lot of those years, they can't afford the kind of things we talked about earlier. Health care, education. Okay, well, I guess the kids don't go to school this year. You know, can't afford school this year. Well, I, we need health care right now, but we can't afford it. Um, it's, it's, this, it's a very real problem. So especially coffee. In the 1990s, the Specialty Coffee Association of America was formed. It really started to coin this term, specialty coffee. What does it mean? It's also priced the commodities market, but it's at a positive differential. So we'll say, I will pay you coffee market C plus 20 or 30 or even 50 cents or maybe even a dollar. You get, you get more than the coffee C, but it's it's still linked. So when the coffee seed goes up, your price goes up. Coffee seed goes down, price goes down, right? Better quality. It's consistent. The number one requirement for 
especially coffee, is consistency. So when we talk about estate coffee or the torch model for developing coffee, what are we talking about? The number one differentiator for me is the price. We must pay a profitable price to farmers every year, the same price. It costs them the same price to grow it. I'm going to sell it to my customers to the same price. I don't change my price based on what the coffee market sees doing. So if I'm if it's costing them the same to grow it, and I'm going to sell it for the same amount, why don't I just pay the farmer the same amount every year? And they know what they're going to make next year. And they can actually start to plan. They don't have to wonder, will I make money or lose money? Make, make sense? But if you want to, if you want to pay a high price to the same for the same coffee every year it has to be high quality it has to be very high quality this is what confuses people for state coffee we're not looking for consistency we're looking for something unique if it is if it's all the same I can't really pay a high price for this coffee I have to have a reason an excuse to pay a high price and I think, the, I think the best example of this is Indonesia. Do we have anyone here from Indonesia? Indonesians? Anyone? Yay, Indonesia. Go Indonesia. Indonesia, amazing place. There's an island there named Sumatra, right? How many of you guys heard of Sumatra coffee? Yes. Everybody has. Why have you heard of Sumatra coffee? It, Starbucks. And Sumatra coffee tastes different. It tastes different. Customers will pay more money for it. Now, my profession is to taste coffee. That's what I do for a living. I taste coffee and I tell objectively this coffee is 81, 82, 85. I grade it. And I train people worldwide to, to grade coffee. I've been to most countries in Asia training people to taste coffee. Um, Sumatra coffee I can tell you what it tastes like. Don't throw anything at me. Tastes like mold. Tastes like dirt. But they, but Sumatras are so creative. They go, we're going to call it earthy. Earthy sounds so much better than moldy and dirty. What happens is they have a special way of processing their coffee there. No, seriously, it's like, think of it as like blue cheese. Blue cheese, what's it taste like? Okay, so some cheese company probably had a whole warehouse of cheese that molded one time. They're like, we're not going to throw this away. This is, we're going to charge double the price. Now it's a specialty cheese, right? <laughs> and so that's what, the, that's what the Indonesians did. They go, no, this is, this is special. And I, I honestly, I, on one hand, I go, this is crazy. On the other hand, I applaud them for it. But it proves the point that customers will pay more for it. One, because it's different. Two, they like it because when I drink Sumatra coffee, I know it's Sumatra coffee. They just like that it's distinctive. And this is why it's hard when you're trying to de develop and work in the coffee market is, I don't know if you noticed, we said specialty coffee must be consistent. But estate coffee must be inconsistent. It must be unique. It must be different than all the rest. We don't even care how. Make it moldy. Make it taste like fruity. Take, make it taste like something we know that's different and we'll pay you more money for it. The, the coffee industry is looking for something unique, something special something that it can recognize from just the, the average baseline coffee that's out there. Traceability of the farm. We call this the, the dog name test. What do we mean? We mean you need to know the name of the dog on the coffee farm. If you don't have information on the farm down to that level, you need to know what variety, what altitude, how much annual rainfall, who the farmers are, and what the name of the dog is on the farm. That's the level of detail you need to know. If you don't know the name of the dog on the farm, you don't really have traceability of the farm. People, if they say, hey, I'm going to pay you a high, high price for this coffee, it's got to taste unique, and I need to know where it comes from. You know, it's, it's like 
the wine industry. I want to know what vineyard this came from. I want to know what variety of grapes it is. I never buy wine that says red wine. What is that? I don't want red wine. I want, I want to know what the variety of grapes is. I want to know what kind of wine this is. I, I prefer to know where it was raised. I wish they'd tell me the name of the dog on the farm where the wine was grown. I'd be even more happy. Here's the key. Transparency of price to farmers. There's a few crazy people out there who are beginning to share the prices they're paying to the farmers. Now it's fine to do if you're paying good prices, but it's pretty embarrassing to do if you're paying low prices. It's, it's a way of doing business, a very transparent way that the customer, younger customers, really connect with. They go, okay, I trust you. I want to do business with you because there's real transparency in what you're paying to farmers. I know that you're paying farmers a price that they can make a living, that they can have their kids educated, that they can have good nutrition, that they can have good health care. Customers care about this. If you don't think they do, you're not following what's happening in the market today. Look at all the surveys out there. 58% of people said, I will buy a product. I will pay more money for it just because I know it's having some sort of social impact. And 100% and of those 58% people, or 99% of them, are all the next generation. It's moving in that direction. The younger generation wants to buy something they know is helping people, helping the environment. I'm a, so, let me pause here for a second. So, when we look at development, one of the, one of the problems is, is that a lot of the things and things you need to do to get from commercial to specialty are moved towards consistency. But to get back over to estate coffee, you need to go back towards inconsistency. So a lot of the prescriptions are different, and so we confuse people. They're like, last year the exchange guy came and told me I should do this. I should install a wet mill. Now you're telling me I should do natural processing. What am I supposed to do? And so we confuse the farmer a lot of time because we're not being specific with what the end goal is for that farmer. I don't know why I have all the flipping arrows. This thought was interesting. Okay, so. Um, this is not very clear. This says 300. Coffee's price per 100 pounds. That's $3 a pound. We have set $3 a pound as a benchmark. Fair trade is right about here, 114 a pound. And the price to produce is just slightly more than that fair trade, which doesn't seem very fair to me, but uh, I, and I'm, I'll be honest, I, I don't bash fair trade. A lot of people say fair trade, fair trade is bad. Actually, they're the one who got the conversation started. They did a lot of great work. But we try to pay three bucks a pound. We're committed th to this price, three bucks a pound. Um, th this is the price paid to farmers. Farm gate price, three bucks a pound. This is the average coffee C, this, this green, uh, the blue one is the average price, no, it's not the coffee seed, it's the average price paid to farmers over the last 25 years. The green is Colombia. You can notice Colombia sticks right near the average. India is down here on the bottom, it's much lower. This little yellow one here, they only have, this is from the ICO, International Coffee Organization. They keep all these records, they have great records. Thailand's right here at the end, they, we only have two years data on Thailand. Uh, it's interesting, it's above average, then it goes to below average. I think, I, my guess is their data is not very complete for Thailand yet. So I think we're going to need a couple years of watching that to see it stabilize. So, we have commercial coffee. And we want to make it. So we need to work to get it towards specialty. We need to work on consistency. A lot of times the prescription will be build a wet mill. You need to build a wet mill. The Gates Foundation, TechnoServe, everybody who's putting money into coffee development, USAID, um, their prescription is build a wet mill. Right prescription. The thing that people should be doing. If your goal is to make a very consistent specialty coffee that will trade linked to the coffee C, but still 
not necessarily at a price that the farmer can make money every year. Then, what if you want to make a steak coffee? You need it to be unique. You're going to have some sort of alternative milling. You're going to have probably dry processing. It needs to be a very niche market. But here's the key. You need market linkages. If you convince some farmer to go out and make some kind of exotic coffee, and you don't have anyone that wants to buy that, he's actually, it won't get accepted by the specialty coffee people because they need consistency. So you've actually hurt the guy. So this is where you must be careful that you do have the market linkages in place. And often this is, this is why we can do development in a really powerful way, because I am the market linkage. I want to buy your coffee. Here's a prescription. And they go, no way, that sounds crazy. They go, it's totally crazy. I'll pay you three bucks a pound every single year you produce this. They go, that sounds really awesome. Let's do this. And so we've guaranteed, we've insured that if they produce it, we'll buy it. Um, and, and so we, for developers or extension people, if you're going to prescribe these things, I do have to confess they're slightly dangerous in that you need to make sure there's a market. However, I will say this. There is an incredible growing market. There's incredible demand out there for high quality coffee. If you look at the growth charts, coffee consumption goes up every single year. But what's more powerful than that is you have to look at the details of those numbers. The amount of commercial coffee is almost stable. All of the growth is in specialty coffee, estate coffee, and high-end coffees. It's these boutique coffees. So, who's this lady? This lady is named Mama Carmen. She's 60 something years old. She runs a home for street kids in Guatemala City. She's one of the best people in the world that I've ever seen at rescuing street kids. She goes out on the streets and just pulls kids in. She goes to the hospital and finds kids that no one wants and just takes them in to her home. She's got 60, 70 kids at any given time. And um, there's, there's people that just hear a story and really move. There's no way you can hear this lady's story and not be moved. There's no way you can listen to this lady talk and not just be in tears. She's incredible stories of how she saves kids and kids with all kinds of diseases. And she just loves them and prays for them. Half these kids see a lot of recovery. Well, in early 2000, about... Ten years ago, she was gifted a coffee farm. People said, I love what you do, Mama Carmen. Here's a coffee farm. I want to I support you in a sustainable way. She's super happy. Who doesn't want a coffee farm? So she's like, yay, coffee farm. And so um, when we hear about her, she's now owned the coffee farm for almost five years. And it's lost money all five years. And um, she's kind of struggling with her coffee farm. And I'm working for an NGO um, who gets in, in contact with her. And um, so I'm meeting with, with the agronomist who just went and visited her farm. He's actually an extension agent for University of Arkansas. And he went down to Guatemala and visited her farm. I sit down with him. We, we talked over the situation. I said, hey, we've got to do something to help. And the words out of my mouth were, somebody has to go there. There's no way we can help this lady from Arkansas. Somebody has to go there. So, right after the words come out of my mouth, I realize I'm the person that has to go there. And so this is me and my wife and two of our kids. On, this is coffee trees behind us. This is on her farm. Um, maybe, maybe five years ago? Um, so we moved down to this coffee farm and first thing we did, we said, what do they have? What are they doing well already? And, and what's, what's the situation? So first thing I did, I sit down with her. I said, Mom, Carmen, how, are you making money on the farm or losing money? She goes, I don't know. I go, okay. I said, well, how much money do you bring in off the farm every year? Uh, I don't know. I go, okay, well, 
how much coffee do you produce every year? Oh, she knew that number. I said, okay, how much do you sell it for? She knew that number. So I'm like, okay, this is how much money you bring in. She goes, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. I said, okay, well, how much do you spend? I don't know. I go, well, what are your expenses? She goes, well, when we pick it, it costs us this much. So, and I got three employees that work year round, local guys that run the manage the farm for me. And I pay them this much per week times 52 weeks a year. And we, pretty soon we had a budget. Guess what the budget said? You're losing money. She goes, I go, Mom Carmen, you're losing money. She goes, yeah, it kind of seems like that. At the end of the year, I always have to. I said, Mom Carmen, I said, this is a problem. You would donate this coffee farm by someone who gave you this farm to feed the kids in your home. And you're taking their food and giving it to the coffee farm. Essentially, you're using the kids' money to feed the coffee farm. I go, this sucks. This is horrible. <laughs> this is not right. And she goes, yeah. So I said, OK, Mama Carmen, we're going to we got to let one of the guys on the farm go. I go, I'm sorry. You just don't have the money to pay him. You can't take the kids' money and give it to him. He goes, yeah, but if I don't pay him, his kids won't eat because there's no jobs in that area. I'm like, OK. So we can't fire anyone. The only other choice is to bring in more money, right? We got a fixed expense line we can't change. So what are we going to do? So we, um, we, figured out, we figured out how can we take her coffee from a commodity to specialty to a steak coffee. Now her coffee farm, her coffee is one of the most sought after coffees in Guatemala. Um, it, now, granted, it was a great coffee to begin with, but we, we first started out, this is a deep pulp, but we first started out wet milling to get it consistent. Then we started out with alternative processing, like natural processing, which uses no water, which is better for the environment, makes great quality coffee. And we began to market it. And we told the story of the name of the dog on the farm. We told the story of Mama Carmen and what she's doing to help people. People go, I want to buy that coffee. And I'll pay you, I don't care the price, I'll pay you the price for it. So we were able to guarantee her a set price every year for that coffee. We started exporting it. These are the, the kids who grew up in the orphanage and the home for kids. And uh, this is the home we lived in. They, they, the kids would come out there. This is Dose Mary, and she, uh, she was just one of the kids who they had picked up and lived in the home. and, and uh, some more kids, they, they love coming out of the coffee farm. Here's the key, here's why it worked. One of the reasons why we were successful in Guatemala is we didn't go out alone. I went and found some Guatemalan coffee farmers that I knew she would listen to them better than me. So I went and found some people who really loved the work she was doing. And these guys have been farming coffee for five generations. They they know more about coffee farming than I'll ever know. They were born knowing more about coffee farming than I know. So we exported coffee, blah, blah, blah. So does it work other places? This is Yemen. This is, this is rock homes in the middle of nowhere in Yemen with coffee drying on the rooftops. This is a Yemenese guy. This is his ID card. In Yemen, you don't get an ID card, you get a knife. You can look at his knife and you can tell what family he's from, what tribe he's from, and they all wear it with him all the time, even in the airport. Like, this is, this is like standard, standard protocol. Friendliest guys ever. Um, amazing, amazing friendly people. And uh, I don't have time for that. Um, so we went to Yemen. We were working, I heard there's someone here from USAID, we were working with USAID. Um, they do amazing work all over the world. They had a big project in Yemen. And we found a cooperative of women growing coffee in Yemen. And Yemenese coffee it ha is, has really mixed quality. So this is us. These, this is not me in the <laughs> black burkas. This is the work we were doing there. These are coffee beans. These are bad coffee beans. We did really simple training. These beans, good. These beans, bad. That simple. Very, very, very simple training. Next year, they won best coffee of Yemen. 
we had Atlas Coffee, we had a um, uh, ton of big companies fighting. I was fighting to get their coffee. We're all fighting over the coffee. They were asking, okay, average price right now is a dollar a pound. We pay three bucks a pound. Everyone was fighting over their coffee for 20 bucks a pound. Now you think these, these ladies are happy? Heck yeah, they're happy. And the, the lady, Fatima, that, grew, that, that runs this women's cooperative, um, what happened, what we've seen happen was really amazing. People need to see it work. They need to see actual examples that this thing actually works. The first year we were in Yemen, no one listened to us. The next year, when these women were offered $21 a pound, they're like, okay, we need to listen up. These guys have something that works here. Um, and so it was, it was a very successful program, unfortunately. Um, we had to pause our work in Yemen slightly for a little while, just because of political instability. Bum, 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 bum. She's telling me I'm out of time. So I'm finished. Um, I was supposed to leave time for questions. I have a workshop later on today. I will be happy to answer any questions there. And I seem to realize like most of you signed up to go out to the coffee farm tomorrow anyway, so we'll have plenty of more time together. But um, in closing, I want to say this. Coffee is one of the only products I know that you can use to touch 100 million people's lives. It's one of the only products I know that can be grown successfully in heavily forested areas. It's incredible. Right now, there's people all over the globe from every walk, whether it's government or nonprofit, all looking to say, how can we do something about the deforestation? Coffee is actually a major, 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 major player in that, in that plan long term. You're going to see more and more coffee being grown under massive shade trees. And it's, it's really important. You have the ability, through coffee, to impact people's lives, even save lives, and invest in the future. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, thank you, Samuel. Uh, Samuel, we, you'll be around this afternoon for your workshop? All right. That's great. I think one of the, the biggest take-home messages metaphorically was get to know the name of the dog on the farm. You should know the name of the dog on the farm. Development work in general. That's a relational aspect um, in, in so many ways. So thank you much. Uh, all right, we're at coffee break. We'll be back here at 1015.